specific or credible threats to New York City this week and nothing directed towards the events surrounding the marathon. As usual, however, our uniform presence will be quite evident wherever one looks this weekend, and our efforts will include much that the public will not see as well. I urge everyone to enjoy this event, but to always remain alert to your surroundings. The, vigil the vigilance of all New Yorkers and that of every visitor to our city helps us all share the responsibility for uh, public safety. If anyone sees anything that doesn't look right or doesn't feel right or makes them feel uncomfortable, I ask them to flag down a police officer and there'll be thousands of them out there on Sunday or call 911 and please give us a chance to investigate it. This is our job to keep people safe. And the bottom line is this, the New York City Marathon is going to be one of the most well-policed, best protected events anywhere in the nation. It's going to be another successful event as it is every year. I'm counting on the NYPD running team to defeat the fire department and to bring home the Mary's Cup finally after a few years. And I know Laura said it was a friendly competition, but I'm really not so sure about that. So, uh, Peter? Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I just want to uh, acknowledge and thank all the men and women in blue that protect this city 365 days a year. It is the safest city uh, on earth, and we really appreciate all the work that they do. Um, also, just to thank Commissioner um, for the partnership over the years, his friendship, his leadership, and allowing us, New York Roadrunners, to do what we do every week in the city's uh, parks, and especially the first Sunday on November um, uh, for the marathon. It is going to be a great marathon, as it always is the greatest marathon in the world in the greatest city in the world. So thank you. Hi, right, good morning, everyone. As you know, this Sunday's marathon is going to bring 51,000 runners and 2.5 million spectators along the route here in New York City. As you can imagine, it's an enormous undertaking to protect this entire route, but it's what the men and women of the NYPD do every day, and they will be up to the task. We've worked closely since uh, since the last run across the finish line last year, planning this event, working hand in hand with the New York Roadrunners Club and a lot of other various law enforcement agencies. On Sunday, you are going to see thousands of cops lining the route. There will be a lot of police officers that you won't see that will be out there. So a lot of visible, a lot of not visible. We are going to have blocker cars and sanitation trucks, sand trucks, all along the route, making sure it is completely secured. We are going to have our school safety agents working both the finish line, the starting line, and the grandstands, winding people that enter to make sure everyone there stays safe. Our heavy weapons teams from ESU, CRC, SRG are going to be all along the route. You will see them out there. We are going to have dozens of our canines working that day. And our bomb squad will be there. Everyone here knows the great work that they do, and they will be out there on Sunday as well. We will have posts on top of rooftops throughout the, throughout the route, keeping observations. Along with all the assets we have on the ground, our aviation units are going to be up, and they'll be surveying the entire route. We will also be taken to the seas with our harbor units. They will be protecting the waterways and the bridges along the route. As you can imagine, traffic along the city will be uh, moving at a slower rate with the 26 miles that are going to be covered on the route, but our traffic agents will be out there making sure that we can keep traffic moving. We're going to have millions of eyes sitting around here watching this parade. They are a force multiplier. It is a shared responsibility for everyone to keep this city safe. So as the commissioner said, if someone sees something, say something. There are going to be cops everywhere. Go up to a cop if anything looks suspicious. If you can't, call 911 or you can call 188-NY-CITY-SAFE. Good luck to the runners and we're going to have a great day on Sunday. Thank you. So the New York City Marathon is actually not about um, terrorism or counterterrorism. It's about competition. It's about sportsmanship. It's, uh, it's a great event uh, where people challenge themselves. But in the context of recent events, whether it's uh, the weekend events um, and the tragic, tragically unfolding in Pittsburgh, or what we saw here in New York City last week uh, with the suspected pipe bombs that were delivered, or the fact that we're on the anniversary of the Halloween attacks from last year today, uh, the trial of the individual who tried to blow himself up in the Times Square subway, 
uh, begins this week in federal court, there is, you know, the underlying context that we always look at, which is along with helping the crowds, making the race move, handling the traffic, there is a complex counterterrorism overlay that comes with all large events in New York City, and this one will be no different. What we try to do is increase the protection without actually affecting the event uh, or, the, or the, the way the event is, is fun and successful for those who organize it. So as Terry said, that will mean things you'll see. You'll see heavy weapons teams from the Counterterrorism Bureau on post, but there will also be mobile teams to respond to things that may happen off route or in other locations. Uh, we'll have radiation detection teams throughout the route. We have our biological detection devices out. Uh, we'll be screening the runners um, and their bags as they come in, and that's part of a, a, a long-established process we've been using for a couple of years. Uh, Plainclothes people will be working uh, the crowds and behind those lines to see if anybody is acting in any kind of suspicious man manner. Uh, these are lessons we picked up from you know, the Boston Marathon case and other experiences. There's also the hardware, um, which is you're talking about uh, over 100 sand trucks um, at key locations uh, as blocker vehicles and uh, what's uh, right now around 560 blocker cars, but that um, is going up as we continue to look at the route for any gaps. Um, in smaller places, you'll see we've also uh, deployed what we call the sugar cubes. Those are those white concrete NYPD um, pieces of block that we deliver with um, our own vehicles and place at any other gaps. Uh, the operation from counterterrorism is uh, going to be run by Chief James Water. Waters. Uh, Deputy Chief Joe Gallucci is here with us today for any specific questions um, on the intel side. Our ops desk, that's the other end of that 188 NYC safe telephone number. They'll be taking tips from those people who see something and say something, and those tips will be going out to pre-deployed uh, multiple intelligence bureau response teams that are going to be in the various boroughs um, along the route ready to follow up on anything they see as suspicious. So we urge everybody um, to be forthcoming if they see something they don't like. Odds are that, you know, in a few feet they can approach a police officer and say that. If not, everybody has a cell phone, pick it up and uh, call either 911 or that hotline. And um, what we hope is everybody has a great time at a successful race. Okay, we take some questions on topic. Yeah. Last year, following the, uh, what happened in the Pike Pass, there was a significant uptick in security in the marathon. Will this year be similar? Will there be major differences? Well, we're going to add some personnel to it. I mean, we have, and I, I said this yesterday uh, about the Halloween parade also, we have to be mindful of what goes on around, uh, around the world and around the nation, just not what happens in New York City. So, as John said, uh, we're using blocker vehicles. Uh, we're going to fill in the gaps with concrete. So, and then uh, we're going to have rooftop posts too. So, we have to really pay attention to what goes on around the world and, and we deploy accordingly. Yep. Scott? Yeah, I mean, it, this is a challenging event. You look, you know, we're covering all five boroughs. You're starting in Staten Island, uh, going over a bridge, going over a number of bridges. Uh, but again, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the streets leading to, to the route, we're making sure we're blocking off. Uh, we have 36,000 uniforms that we can pull from. We have a, uh, a great counterterrorism unit. We have a CRC, SRG, ESU will all be out there. So it is, it is challenging. You know, it's not like New Year's Eve where there's a limited area. We're talking about the bow tie area. Even the Thanksgiving Day Parade, even that, you know, that's a, that's a long route too, but it's a little easier to secure because it's uh, not quite as long. So it's a challenge, but this is something that uh, the NYPD, along with all of our partners, including the New York, New York Roadrunners Club, uh, we do very well. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I, I I actually use that uh, the West Side bike path quite often, and uh, immediately after uh, last uh, Halloween, you saw the Jersey barriers that were put in uh, to prevent unauthorized vehicles there. And the state is now in the process of replacing those Jersey barriers with bollards. Uh, it looks like they're going to be done sometime in 2019, finishing that. 
make it a little bit easier for pedestrian and traffic and runners and bikes to go up and down that path, but it is secure. Anything else on topic? Yep. No, let's, we're going to stay on topic for now. And, are you getting there? Okay. All right. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, the question is with uh, what happened uh, with the, the uh, packages that were mailed throughout the United States, has that changed the way we're thinking about the marathon? So we don't just concentrate on the route. We do go a couple streets on each side uh, to make sure that they're secure too. You know, we look for suspicious vehicles. So that, that's part of the process of keeping the route safe. Anything else on topic? All right, I think we're going to reset a little bit for do some off topic. Okay. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, Peter. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Got some off topic. I'll start with the uh, attack outside of Odega in the Bronx this week. Uh, gang going after a teenager, saved by someone from Odega. How is that case proceeding? Good. Dermot, do you have an update on that? No. No? Okay. Yeah, we're going to have to get back to you on that. Sure. But. Uh, it was, it was good to see that the, the people in the, I think the story is the uh, people in the bodega, the workers there, help protect uh, the victim. And that's what we need to see if we're going to continue to make this the safest large city in America. Uh, quite frankly, all 8.6 million New Yorkers have to step up, and it's a shared responsibility to keep the city safe. So I'll, I'll start off and say there is no tolerance for hate crimes in New York City. Uh, we have the uh, best hate crimes uh, unit in, in the nation, quite frankly, and, and each and every crime that gets reported to them is fully investigated. Dermot, I don't know if you have an update on that investigation. Just briefly, in, in the confines of the 84th Precinct, we did have several incidents of swastikas being drawn. Uh, they're being investigated at this time as potential hate crimes, which we believe it will bear out that they were. Uh, what we've seen in the last month, um, is an increase in anti-Semitic hate crimes, uh, particularly swastikas uh, on buildings um, in parts of the city. Uh, makes up anti-Semitic uh, hate crimes make up about half of all of the hate crimes that we see in, in New York City. It, it usually makes up the largest portion, uh, but in the last 28 days particularly, which is a little troublesome, we have seen an uptick in that category. So I have confidence uh, the hate crimes detectives will get on that. We'll do the normal course of action. We'll be interviewing people in the community, looking for video, and try to apprehend whoever's responsible as quickly as possible. It's, it's tough to uh, you know, get into the minds of those doing it. Certainly the actions that are going on around the world could have something to do with it, but pinpointing it is very difficult. And just to add to that, and as I spoke about shared responsibility, if, uh, you know, if you have any video you know, in, your, in your home, in, in the, uh, Criminal mischief cases are, are fairly difficult to investigate, so we need everybody's help if they have video or if they saw something, if they could uh, dial 911 or call their local precinct to help us investigate it. Yep, Mark. Uh, Chief Shea will give, you, he'll give you an update on that. So a lot, a lot done in a, in a short period of time. Uh, first, as I said, uh, Publicly, the first priority was identifying the girls, uh, young ladies. And, and once that was done, I think that we've made uh, significant progress in, in piecing together pieces of this puzzle to find out what happened. Uh, detectives have been down in Virginia. They've conducted a number of interviews in Virginia, including members of the immediate family, as well as others. Um, and and those, those interviews are really um, unraveling in some way a piece of the puzzle of behind the scenes what was going on in, in the two young ladies lives uh, there is still work to do later this afternoon uh, we're going to be releasing updated pictures those pictures were obtained with uh, cooperation of the family and again we're looking at a two-month gap and we're looking at a two-month gap uh, the detectives work has filled in many of the pieces but there's still some gaps that we would like to um, fill in and get a real clear picture of 
what happened in the last two months. But there has been, uh, I, will, I will call it significant progress, trying to get the complete picture of what ultimately led to the two young ladies being discovered. Uh, no comment on that. Um, you know, we owe it to the victims in any case to do our due diligence and follow the facts. I think the detectives are doing exactly that here, and I'm confident that when the complete investigation is done, we'll have a, a good idea of what exactly transpired, and we'll update you accordingly as facts come in. I'm not going to get into any facts on the family. Time for one or two more, please. Uh, yeah, we've we've worked collaboratively collaboratively with uh, with the city council on those bills, so yeah, we fully support them. Yeah. Listen, uh, and I and I've said this numerous times. Uh, the NYPD is is not perfect, like uh, I don't think any agency is, and we're always looking to improve. And I think this will help us move forward, and uh, this will this will help uh, us bring justice to the survivors of sexual assault. Anything else? All right, hold on one more. Yeah, I spoke about this uh, a number of times since uh, Eric made his comments. Uh, NYPD officers, while they're in New York City, are required on duty or off duty to carry their firearms. There are some exceptions. Uh, if you're on vacation or if uh, you're going to go somewhere, there's a possibility of loss of theft. So that's, that's already, you know, in our DNA. This is why we become cops to keep people safe and, and carrying a firearm is, is, uh, is part of that, it's part of that process. So, any other questions? Thanks guys. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks.